we have a um, couple of uh, great presenters today um, that will talk to us about doing advocacy for cardiac services for childhood onset um, heart disease. And um, there are two different stories that we will hear about um, that I believe are very interesting and a lot can be learned from. Um, one is from um, an organizational perspective for the organization I work for, Children's Heartlink, and I forgot to introduce myself, even though my name is here, Bistra Zelova. <laughs> and um, the other one is uh, by uh, Ruth Munguaro, who is also representing an organization, but it's really a patient advocacy story. And we'll start with Ruth, and Ruth, I think, wants to say something to me. <laughs> yes, um, please en enable me to share my slides. Ah, uh, okay, that has to be done by probably by the host. Yes, the host. Apologize. Yes, so Amy or Sheila have to do that. Okay. Is it working? Not yet. Mm. Okay. It's saying host disenabled participant screen sharing. Okay, if you cannot do that. I just, I just, um, Turned it on. Okay. Okay. Working now? Yep, it should Good. work. Okay. Okay, we can see it. You can see it? Yes. So um, I think we all can turn off our videos and just keep Ruth on uh, while she's. Um, telling us a story. So just quickly to introduce who Ruth is. Um, um, Ruth was actually born with a congenital heart disease. Uh, she's from Kenya originally. She lives in the United States now. And so she's going to talk to us about um, how um, she was a co-founder of a group in, um, in Nairobi in Kenya um, and uh, how they got their government actually to make some significant changes. Um, and um, what the power of actually patients gathering together has been. So um, go ahead, Ruth. Thank you very much, Bistra. As you've heard, my name is Ruth. I'll be, pre I'll be presenting on Advocacy in Action, Advocating for Childhood Onset Heart Diseases at the national level. Uh, this is uh, the outline. I will introduce the organization in Kenya Kenya Mended Heart Patients Association. I'll give a program analysis. I'll give empowerment, then par partnerships with like-minded organizations, and then government involvement at both county and national levels. Uh, Kenya Mended Heart Patients Association, uh, the slogan is a heart was touched, a heart shall inspire. That means it's, it's a heart-based organization that was founded in 2016. The founders were the late Samuel Ketasang, who was living with rheumatic heart disease till his demise, may he so rest in peace. The other one is Jacqueline Bogwa, who was living with congenital heart, who is living with congenital heart disease. And she's also, also a parent of a child with congenital heart disease. And myself, Ruth Nguaro. The supporters and mentors who helped us start off are pediatric cardiologist, uh, led by Dr. Naomi Gashara, adult cardiologists led by Dr. Bernard Gitura, Mr. Ruben Magoko of KDDA. He's a, he's a patient advocate for people living with diabetes and the late Dr. Eva Mushemi. Uh, about, more about uh, Kenya Mended Heart Patients Association. It is a charitable non-profit making organization with an affiliation to the Ministry of Health Division of Non-Communicable Diseases. Uh, the vision is to have a community that values and understands the health of their hearts. And the mission is to advocate, educate, and create awareness while giving hope to patients, their families, friends, and supporters. The, the main objectives of the group is to create awareness to heart-related to heart conditions to the general public, to advocate and lobby for the rights and responsibilities of people living with heart conditions, to partner, to be a partner, a link between researchers, collaborators, partners, and other stakeholders to people living with heart diseases, to create mutual working relationships with other 
private and public partners to consolidate people living with heart conditions and to encourage them to start support groups and then to participate in all national and international heart days. This is a picture of our members, some of our members during our World Heart Day. We were celebrating it in collaboration with uh, the Ministry of Health in Kenya, the Kenya Cardiac Society and other sponsors who, who supported us. Then I'll acknowledge the partners. We had National Council of Churches of Kenya. They, I will give more on the details on how we work together. We have NCD Alliance of Kenya, that is Non-Communicable Disease Alliance of Kenya. We have PLOs, that is a patient-led organizations in Kenya. We have Kenya Cardiac Society, Ministry of Health in county and national level, and then the local media, which is a print, audio, and television. The problem statement is uh, based on the population and World Health Organization report, 5,000 children were uh, required congenital heart surgeries in Kenya each year. Kenya performs between 120 to 150 congenital open heart operations. A similar number are 120 to 150 of congenital characterization intervention. Approximately 50 to 100 additional patients receive, uh, receive treatment outside Kenya, most of whom are self-funded. Then a total of a total of any of only about 400 congenital heart patients, which is about 80%. 8% sorry receives the life changing intervention and the rest 4600 that is 92% either get no care at all or I'll just manage with the causes with the which causes irreversible damage to the adulthood then I'll give a list of cardiac hospitals offering surgeries to RHD and CHD patients uh, we have the public versus the private hospitals and mission. Uh, the public hospitals, we have Kenyatta National Hospital. We have Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldolet. We have Tenwek Hospital, which is a mission hospital in, Ten in Bomet. We have Coast General Hospital in Mombasa. Then the uh, private hospitals are at the Khan University Hospital. We have Gertrude's Hospital. We have Mpisha Hospital, Mata Hospital, Karen Hospital. Nairobi Hospital and Nairobi West Hospital. Then we have now, what are the key challenges that are faced by patients in Kenya? They had patients in Kenya. We have afford affordability. Uh, Kenya, Kenya's population is just under 50 million with more than 40, 46% living below the poverty line. So you find like most people, like a good majority of the number are living below the poverty line. Most in fact, are sent abroad for their procedures. So you find, uh, for example, in Kenya, uh, an open heart surgery costs uh, around $20,000, that is in a private hospital. And you find if you're living below the poverty line, most of them earn less than a dollar a day. So you can see how that, that is challenging to raise $20,000. Then the other one is access, access to care. There exist uh, the 12 cardiac centers, most of them which are the, in the capital city, uh, hence requiring the patients to travel. Then four out of the 12 are government for the limited resources and capacity, hence with limited, with limited resources and capacity, hence less procedures are done while others are private and faith-based. Then awareness creation is the other challenge. Uh, the setup and the setup and educational awareness programs are not extensive in providing care for the patients with children, uh, congenital heart disease. Most of the community health providers have very little to no knowledge about it. So we go to the empowerment part, where we go to civic education seminars. What what now? How Kenya Mended was involved? It was in civic education seminars human rights and responsibilities of citizens, constitution empowerment and involvement of citizens, policy making process and citizen empowerment. Uh, why were they doing so? So I'll go back to that slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so in the part for civic education, this is where our partners come in. Uh, 
why did why did we find it why did we find the need to get into partnerships or affiliations the main objectives for doing this were to run from other like-minded people and organizations to add to our voice in advocacy hence get an increase in number to get authorization to advocate directly to federal patients at all the levels of governance empowerment on hard conditions by professionals and to reach out to masses so here are some of the pictures of the things i've highlighted this is uh myself and uh, uh this lady who was from the diabetes association but she passed on we have so rest in peace during a radio interview so this is the audio interview where we were creating awareness on a person that was working on heart diseases then how she was working on diabetes so we were youths from uh Nairobi County, we are running that project with the NCD Alliance, I mean, sorry, with the NCCK, that is a church organization. Uh, this one is, uh, we are running this project on the second picture here. We were running this project with the NCD Alliance of Kenya. We had gone to a health center in Machakos County, where we were, we went and talked to their healthcare providers and told them on what we felt they should know as a patient we also went for this for this one we went around the market area where we, we found a lot of citizens some were gathered in a in a in a stadium like place where we to, talked to them about the signs and symptoms and told them where to seek their medical advice just in case they had this, the signs and symptoms of the non-communicable diseases i was representing the heart group is myself on this picture is a collaboration with the county government this was a stakeholders meeting with the nairobi county where we had uh, been advocating for inclusion of non-communicable diseases in the in their physical strategy paper because you find like mostly in kenya they focus mostly on communicable diseases and it was like non-communicable diseases were a bit invisible but you were glad were able to bring it to the county's attention and they were able to put it in their strategy paper. Then this one was the, the group, the team from the patient, people living with non-communicable diseases whom we were working with on, on all the projects have highlighted that we had partnerships. Then we go to the government involvement. How are we involved with the government? There, there is an Affordable Health Care Act by, by the government for low income citizens. This one happened in 2017, where the government of Kenya uh, introduced the four agendas for, the, for, for their term. Healthcare was part of it. And this is where in June, 2017, uh, NHF partnered with private hospitals in celebrating their 50th anniversary and covered the surgeries. I mean, the heart surgeries in, in particular uh, uncovered the surgeries fully in local hospitals for a whole year. So these took the heart patients a long way because like uh, in the national hospital, there was a waiting list in the Kenyatta National Hospital, there was a waiting list of more than 600 patients. And now with, with, the, with the challenge of getting the money for surgery, so this one was able to make, to help with the waiting list. A lot of people received care and they were distributed to the private hospitals within the area. Uh, the government uh, also recognized that there was a challenge in non-communicable diseases. Hence, after paying the less than uh, $500 currently, because the exchange is a bit high, in paying less than $500 a month, you are able to be covered about, uh, the government is able to offer a coverage of about $5,000 for your operation, whether it is open heart or any other operation in, in reference to non-communicable diseases. Then the county government of Nairobi uh, acknowledged that there was a need. Therefore, there was a budgetary allocation on non-communicable diseases. Then the cit citizens in towns and counties who had visited were more empowered. Uh, what, what is ongoing right now? There is uh, ongoing the universal health coverage efforts to include management of heart diseases. Because you find like after the government is able to support the heart patient to pay 
the five thousand dollars it's usually a challenge to get them to cover the the management process that is in private hospitals where you you go to public hospitals they're usually overcrowded so we are trying to negotiate with them through our advocacy on how best we can work so that they can be able to cover both in private and public hospitals for, an, for a normal citizen but uh it's good to note like for the civil uh, civil servants those who work for the government organizations it's able to cover for the management and everything and the surgery then ongoing uh, advocacy to equip sub county hospitals with specific diagnostic equipments for the heart the government of kenya was very instrumental in uh, leasing uh, medical equipments but we find like we did not have much of the uh, heart related equipments uh, provided for the heart patients so we are still in advocacy on that then there is ongoing advocacy for the nhf to increase their support for surgeries both locally and abroad then we have ongoing advocacy on policy change by people living with non-communicable diseases uh, that is a, a patient's led organization to the ministry of health so this is a physical strategy paper. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to send a link. Uh, this is a meeting where we met with the health committee of Nairobi County. And this is the one of the colleagues we were with for the interview. Her name is Kate, uh, late Catherine. Uh, so we were presenting our grievances to the uh, health committee in, in Nairobi County. Um, those are my references. Then we have some uh, reference videos uh, on advocacy and articles we did for the awareness campaign. This one is from a newspaper. Most of them will need like to subscribe first what you can read. We have YouTube interviews that uh, myself and the late Samuel Keta had on TV on the congenital heart disease awareness during World Heart Day. And also this one was on rheumatic heart disease awareness. Then um, this one was also an article on congenital heart disease. Uh, if people have any questions, that would be all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. This was uh, great. So I think I'll leave the questions for later. Um, I'll let Adriana uh, do her um, presentation. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this. I think it's a great example of multi-stage advocacy, how you did of you know, working with different organizations. So, um, so Adriana, are you able to um, share your screen? Let's see. Let me try doing that. Um, Ruth, can you click stop sharing? Oh, sorry. No, no problem. Here I come. Let's see. Okay. Can you see the screen now? I'm sorry, just to quickly introduce Adriana. And Adriana, if you want to turn on your video uh, while we do that. Um, Adriana Dobzitska is the um, uh, country director for India and Vietnam at Children's Heartlink. And um, she will tell us about a program that Children's Heartlink, um, specific program that Children's Heartlink had in the state of Kerala in India. Um, and of working with the state government there about making some specific changes on how care is provided. Um, Adriana has a lot of experience uh, working in different countries with hospitals and um, clinicians. And this was our first such project that she led um, in India. And so I do think it's a very interesting story as well of looking how from um, an organizational technical assistance uh, perspective that um, we can discuss. Go ahead, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you, Bistra. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you so much to Global Arch for uh, having me here today. Uh, Ruth, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to learn about your story and your work. So um, I'm humbled to be here to share um, the work that we've done in Kerala with you today. So um, today we'll talk about We'll talk about the global burden of uh, CHD and about Trans Heartlink and the work that we do. We'll also talk about a CHD care in India 
And then, of course, uh, we'll talk about the Government of Care Lab partnership uh, that we have developed over the years uh, in the southern state of Kerala in India. As you know, uh, congenital heart disease is the most common birth defect in the world. About one in 100 children are born with CHD, and about one in four will need surgery or some sort of treatment before the first year of life. Um, however, the, the, the average, on average, it's unfortunately only one in 10 of children get the care that is needed. So when uh, talking about the population health framework, um, it's important to consider the CHD not just as an individual disease, but actually uh, within the whole um, uh, sort of uh, environment of the individual and the networks that the individual fits within, uh, the hospital level, the health system level, and the policy level. And only by engaging all those different levels, we can uh, achieve improved access to quality pediatric cardiac care. Uh, that, in, uh, that means engaging uh, patients and their families, as well as enhancing capacity at the hospital level, but also at the health system to ensure earlier detection and uh, that um, infrastructure and screening is, uh, is working well. At the uh, policy and regulatory environment, uh, we need to ensure that uh, medical uh, school and med medical education adequately addresses the needs of uh, and, and covers CHD also health financing and utilizing enabling technologies are very important uh, to address uh, CHD uh, in, the, in the full extent. Children's Heartland well, works to, um, the, our vision is for children around the world to, access, to have access to high quality care. And our mission is to save the lives of children with heart disease. And in order to do that, we partner with organizations to train medical teams provide education and transform healthcare in underserved part of the world. In terms of CHL approach, our approach is based on an understanding that unfortunately there is a shortage of, of trained medical professionals and also a shortage of centers that deliver high quality CHD care. There may be poor outcomes and high mortality and morbidity and oftentimes there's no coordinated national plans to address CHD and there is also a unequal distribution of resources. The components of our strategy, therefore, are based on universal needs as well as universal access to care and uh, the need for creating sustainable centers that have capacity to treat children of CHD in an adequate manner. There is a timely diagnosis and referral, but there, there also there is a system for lifelong care and follow-up, as well as awareness and taught leadership. So in 2016, uh, looking more broadly from our uh, hospital-based approach, we looked at what other, within an environment, what other things we could do in order to affect those uh, broader levels that I shared uh, with you uh, earlier. And so we, uh, we thought about the macro impact strategy as being a strategy that would address gaps in care outside of the tertiary hospital, which we have historically uh, been partnering with. They would improve uh, care pathways, so from screening, referral, and follow-up, and really looking more comprehensively at the, um, at the path that the patient uh, has to um, go through in order to get that treatment as well as the follow-up care that's needed for the lifetime. And we looked at partnership with the government and working within their priorities. So that was a very critical element um, as, um, as we developed this work is to ensure that the government was very motivated uh, to uh, make the changes that were needed in order for the whole pathway of care to be impacted. We also looked at locations uh, with CHL centers of excellence. So among the uh, partner sites that we work with, the hospital programs that we work with, uh, we have some that are designated as centers of excellence. Those are hospital uh, partners that have been engaging uh, with children's heartening for uh, quite some time and they have very high quality uh, programs. They also teach others and share knowledge in order to ensure that other programs as well can improve their quality of care uh, and the number of children that they treat. So before talking about the Kerala partnership, I wanted to share with you a little bit more about the need and the reality of CHD care in India. So um, 
It is estimated that about 240,000 children are born with CHD in India, and of this, about 48,000 need an operation within the first year of life. Um, it is, however, estimated uh, that about 27,000 uh, patients have um, underwent uh, surgery in 20, uh, 2016, 17, of, whose, uh, of whom uh, 9,700 were infants. This means that about only a quarter of the need is being, um, uh, is being um, addressed currently uh, in India on an estimated basis. Also, it is estimated that we should have at least one center for pediatric cardiac care for every five to 10 million uh, children, uh, sorry, for every five to 10 million uh, in population. So that would mean that in India, we would need about 200 to 1,000 pediatric cardiac uh, heart programs. However, um, the reality is there are about 60 plus um, that do a pediatric cardiac care of, who, of which about 10 have high volume. So as you can see, there is uh, definitely a discrepancy between the need and uh, what's available. In terms of center distribution too, there is a very unequally uh, distributed um, center as a um, map that I will show you in a moment where the North doesn't have as many centers as the South. And this has to do with some historical reasons of how governments in the South and in the, uh, in the North invest uh, in healthcare and the priority that's assigned to health um, as an area of investment. Uh, in terms of staffing, there's also very significant shortages uh, among surgeons and cardiologists, as well as nurses, and especially uh, highly trained uh, professionals who are specifically trained on pediatric um, front are uh, uh, very, uh, very small in number. This is the map of India. And of course, this is the, the little stars, the little red stars are the pediatric cardiac program. So you see them clustering a lot in the south. Uh, the cluster on the left-hand side, sort of the long state, uh, is Kerala. On the right, uh, there is Tamil Nadu. And then the other clusters are, one of them is Mumbai, New Delhi, uh, a few programs in Kolkata. So as you can see, there is a geographical distribution, geographic distribution of the centers is not equal. Um, if you look at the yellow parts, those are where the programs are located. Historically, Children's Heart has first um, approached uh, heart, uh, heart programs in the South as well, um, and have also developed, uh, started developing partnership yeah, in the North also. So before our uh, work started in Kerala, uh, there, there is about 33 million um, people living there and about uh, 500,000 born every year. And so at the time of our uh, launch of the macro strategy, there were about 6,500 infant deaths a year, um, 4,000 children with CHD being born every year. And there's about, in terms of critical CHD, so those children that need the operation within the first year of life, we estimated about 1,000 of those were born out of the uh, 4,000 uh, new CHD cases. About 2,000 uh, pediatric cardiac open operations were happening, and about, uh, so, sorry, about 2,000 uh, open heart operations were happening with, uh, uh, with uh, 500 uh, infants being operated. So the 2,000 encompassed infants and older children, the infants are the critical CHDs. About 1,300 uh, calf procedures, so, um, and then about 780 infant deaths. So what also, besides having a centers of excellence uh, in the state of Kerala, the important catalyst for this work of the macro strategy and government partnership has been the RBSK national insurance scheme. So as Ruth has said as well, the payment for this procedure is a really huge uh, barrier for treatment, access to treatment. And so when the government of India, the central government has created the RBSK national insurance scheme, that enable coverage from the government, from the local government side for some critical uh, birth defects, including CHD. And that's uh, that starting in 2016 or so became a critical area of opportunity for the work that we, um, we launched with the government. Uh, in 2013, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics estimated that in Kerala, uh, infant mortality causes where prematurity was the number one, about 35%. But just right uh, second um, at 28% was congenital anomalies. 
and CHD was chief among those. So while prematurity is very difficult to address as a cause of death, uh, CHD was seen as something that could be tackled uh, in a much um, more streamlined and efficient manner. So the government of Kerala priorities, we talked earlier about working with those priorities, was a very strong commitment and interest in lowering the infant mortality rate from 12 to 8 by 2020 and to 6 by 2030. And this is part of a national trend in India, as you see, that has seen over the years a decrease uh, of IMR uh, overall in the country. However, Kerala has, um, as with the government of Kerala, representative uh, shared with us stagnated over the years in that it had a very low rate of uh, IMR and the government really wanted to do something to decrease it even farther. And so the government, the collaboration uh, goal was to decrease infant mortality by addressing CAG, the CHD through timely screening and appropriate referral. So what steps did we take um, in uh, setting up this partnership? So uh, we uh, realized that obviously it was very important to scale children's harming efforts in CARA in order to decrease uh, infant mortality rate. We, uh, we learned that the government of Kerala was very interested uh, in this effort. And this we learned because we um, met a government representative at a number of different events and, and discussions that we were um, uh, part of uh, with our Center of Excellence, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in Kochi. And so we learned that the government was really looking at this goal of reducing infant mortality from 12 to eight um, and felt that the congenital heart uh, disease was a way to also achieve the sustainable development goals by addressing the morbidity and mortality of CHD that would help drive uh, the IMR down. Uh, there was a, a set of discussions with providers and on-site assessment that followed in March 2016. And these discussions were held at the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. And it was um, the initial sessions were really brainstorming of all the providers, the main pediatric cardiac programs in the state that came together and talked about the challenges they encounter in treating children. And then the government representative offered an insight um, about and really took the time to learn about um, what was happening and what were some of the challenges that the providers encountered. And we then um, had some, a series of side visits to those providers and then made the case for a statewide approach that would connect the provider challenges and expand and extend and look at the, uh, at the patient pathway to address those challenges upstream as they um, as, as we uh, heard this uh, kind of term um, over and over again, the need to address the need upstream in the detection and early screening. So that there was, uh, there was data analysis of the demand versus supply, the cost interventions versus cost of staying the course and then identifying uh, possible solutions. So the needs assessment and the more extended needs assessment happened in the fall 2016 and speaking to a lot of providers and seeing them in their environment and uh, traveling throughout the state was really an eye-opening experience. We um, talked to uh, public hospitals and they, they offer prenatal care, uh, uh, sorry, that offer a primary care and uh, looked at prenatal, neonatal and childhood, um, uh, childhood uh, screenings. Uh, we looked at diagnosis, referral and prioritization uh, a treatment and follow up and uh, to understand better what was happening on the ground. And so uh, we built a, the initial partnership was around a creating community capacity building. And in this case, community, I mean, clinical community, um, as well as cr the creation there was a, a very clear need for a tool to identify, register and prioritize cases and building uh, system efficiencies. And so this is the, uh, the pediatric uh, cardiac care continuum that uh, goes from recognition to diagnosis, referral, uh, safe transport, treatment, and follow-up. And we mapped out uh, against this, um, this pathway of care, we mapped out what kind of resources were available, what barriers there were, where the intervention needed to happen first. And so um, 
in order to uh, to build a, a to build momentum for creating capacity, uh, there was a, a planning stage, of course, uh, that we engaged in, which uh, in which we identified that community capacity building and knowledge transfer needed to happen. So to enhance the knowledge of the primary uh, level uh, providers to screen and refer appropriately, there was a registry uh, that uh, was uh, set up in the early stages of our partnership for um, uh, identifying children uh, with CHD and then helping the prioritization to a treatment. The screening itself with pulse oximetry was enhanced as well as prenatal screening. And then uh, building system efficiencies included, included discussions about new pediatric heart centers in the public sector, especially. Uh, we also utilize the patient uh, education discharge instructions uh, to educate patients and their families and manage their expectation about what to expect uh, in terms of uh, treatment being provided before and after uh, the operation, and then discuss stabilization and transport. And so the knowledge transfer really was about uh, the challenges there were about managing multiple audiences. And we, in the earlier stages of our project, worked with uh, pediatricians. They are the first ones that really see children upon birth. So it's important for them to have a better understanding of CHD. It was about prenatal screening with radiologists and OBGYNs so that they could um, help and identify potential CHD prior to birth. Uh, and it was really um, about, we needed to identify not only the audience, but the faculty. And so Amrita was a big support in this um, and the logistics to make sure that the trainings were really easy to access. We help trainings throughout the state and of course, evaluating of impact. Um, the launch of Hubiam, this database that I alluded to in, 2000, in August of 2017 was uh, made a huge difference because suddenly the pediatricians uh, who were doing the newborn, uh, newborn screening as well as uh, the OBGYNs and radiologists who were doing prenatal screening were able to have a tool where uh, patients could be referred to uh, to then um, uh, be connected to services and treatment. And the government administered Huyam uh, so that uh, to ensure that uh, all um, uh, could uh, access it, whether they were getting them treated in public or private sector or born in public or private sector, this program uh, is available to all. And so the important element of this is this was set up by the government as a universal health access kind of uh, platform. And so that all uh, families uh, throughout Kerala can access it, whether they have resources or they do not. Uh, and uh, the government would cover uh, um, is a certain portion of those um, uh, of the costs associated with the procedure uh, based on a national uh, sort of uh, price book reimbursement book uh, that was developed by the RBSK um, system uh, for the national level. So in terms of accomplishments, there have been many community capacity building trainings that were held. In the first two years of our work, we held workshops, as I said, on prenatal screening, newborn screening, and pediatrician training, as well as parent education discharge instructions, so that we could, on that referral pathway, ensure that we um, increase the early diagnosis uh, and, um, uh, and identification of CHD, and that we also enhanced uh, the education of families at the tertiary uh, level, but also uh, there was a need to improve uh, transportation uh, of patients. Uh, since in Kerala, Kerala is uh, quite lucky that there are about eight programs, pediatric cardiac programs that provide care, but the geography of it is such that again, the northern part of the state doesn't have as many programs as the southern part of the state. So transportation, um, say all the way from the north to all the way to the south, uh, is a critical element uh, due to the geography there. We also helped establish an e-learning platform for pediatricians. And this is, was with the support of, of an um, of a organization that we worked with for the national e-learning for pediatric cardiology. So this continuous learning element was very important. Uh, and um, starting this, uh, this month, actually, there will be a similar resource uh, that is launched uh, for staff nurses actually today they had their first session. Uh, the newborn screening was launched in May 2018, and the physical exam um, in conjunction with the uh, pulse oximetry was launched uh, last year. 
and of course the two uh, combined, the post oximetry and the physical exam, are what, uh, the optimal standard for um, a newborn screening to uh, detect the maximum number of CHDs. We also created to help create a number of resource uh, resources, the fetal echo booklet, the pulse oximetry screening poster and booklet, as well as RBSK nurses manual. And RBSK nurses are community nurses who are mainly involved in a follow-up uh, with families before and after operation. Uh, we also uh, supported and advised the hospital capacity building efforts uh, on expanding that capacity to new centers, uh, as well as advice on the development of new pediatric um, heart centers. In terms of next steps, what's uh, very important uh, for us to do is to improve quality and access. This is a continuous effort to ensure that um, all children that are born have access to the prenatal and newborn screening and that are identified as quickly as possible to ensure this optimal outcomes of treatment. That their process of being identified, from being identified to receiving treatment and the follow-up is streamlined and that is time efficient because time is of the essence that we ensure safe and timely transport this is really critical there's no more heartbreaking situation that having a child being identified but having no appropriate transport and by the time the child arrives uh, to the hospital for treatment he or she is in such poor condition that the chances of a good outcome are much less this really needs to be enhanced as well as continuing training uh, and, and, and ensuring that the clinicians who are both involved in the treatment as well as those associated with that, like pediatricians, uh, OBGYNs, radiologists who are involved in fetal echo screening, uh, they are as knowledgeable as possible uh, about CHD. Uh, hospital capacity building also needs to continue, uh, so continue enhancing quality of existing centers and the tracking of quality so that continuous quality improvement can take place. Uh, planning for additional centers, even in Kerala, that has so many programs uh, based on those numbers that I shared with you earlier, uh, they could use um, a, a better distribution of their centers uh, uh, to ensure that the care is provided in an um, even better uh, and more accessible manner. Uh, monitoring of quality is very uh, critical and uh, strengthening program, program sustainability, I would say, is one of the biggest challenges. This program is about uh, four years old, uh, and there are uh, the ever, everybody, as our government uh, um, representative says, everybody can start something and be quite successful, but sustaining it and ensuring that there's continuous support of funds and uh, continuous growth and enhancement of capacity and quality is where the challenge really lies for the long term. Um, and continue engaging frontline health workers, so these community nurses who are engaged in the newborn screening, in the pre and post op uh, follow up is really uh, critical, along with the continued funding. So I'm happy to um, to uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Adriana. A very comprehensive overview of this project. Obviously, very different from what we heard from Ruth. Ruth, do you want to bring up um, your video and um, unmute yourself? back so we can have a few questions okay um uh, thank you both and i i hope that um people that find this uh, both of these presentations interesting um even though they came from a completely different perspective Ruth was in a situation where there really isn't much heart surgery happening in um, in kenya and in nairobi where they were um, advocating and so they kind of were starting to, to build a case and uh, we're building financing at least for some of the cases and compare that to Kerala where we were trying to capture pretty much every child born with a congenital heart disease um, from prenatally even and um, newborn stage. So very different, but both need um, addressing in different circumstances. So um, I really appreciate both of you telling and sharing this. Um, I. Um, we have some questions here, and so I'll start with the first um, First one is for Adriana. Um, what was involved in getting the government to listen, engage, and act, and how it was done? If you can share quickly, Adriana. Yes, yes, you know, the, with our work with, with Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences uh, has been going on for about 15 years, um, and um, 
we met the uh, young uh, pediat uh, pediatrician who was working with the government at the, at the time. Uh, he was uh, at, the, at UNICEF at the, time, at the time, attached to the government of Kerala. And I would say that his personal interest and willingness to champion this cause was really critical. And so connecting with him, um, uh, thanks to our partners, local partners, was uh, what, um, what really laid the foundation for this. So finding those people who are interested in doing something and then uh, helping them with the information to make that case internally within the government was was really critical. Yeah, very important point. Him, giving them the information um, and kind of addressing, showing what the problem is, enumerating the problem, so to say. Okay, next question for Ruth. Um, what uh, would you say you have achieved in terms of policy change and access with this program, Ruth? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'll, I'll give generally on what uh, we have achieved as Kenya Mended Hearts in partnership with the uh, non-communicable diseases. We were able to get attention from the government and by that we were able to submit a policy document to our Ministry of Health at the national level. The other one we were able to reach uh, the public on awareness creation and also able to sensitize the healthcare workers on the tertiary level on, on the conditions that you are advocating for. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have another question for Adriana. Um, Adriana, uh, this effort in the state of Kerala is commendable. What can we do to drive and build policy level approach under RBSK from the central government to tackle CHD that will support the states, other states in India? Can you share a little bit about what other states in India or what you know about, about other places? You know, being an international NGO, we are very well aware that our role can be mainly that of advising, technical assistance, and so on. So again, as um, is supporting the government with having the information and the tools uh, to really share their story and the platform to share uh, their story with others, with other um, governments in the country has been what we have uh, really tried to do. And so, uh, for example, creating a, a, a conference that would bring uh, representatives of other governments uh, from India was one way of like amplifying this uh, work and the knowledge about it, the awareness about it. And it was the head, like, there was our um, government of Kerala representative encouraging him to share the story with other states and what steps can be taken tangibly to um, address CHD was where we, um, where we, I would say, were most active. Yeah. In, in another piece to say about the RBSK is that um, it was this very unique program that was started at, at a um, national level that gave direction and money to the states to implement, but not every state implemented it. And so it took um, it took really leadership from the state of Kerala to want to implement this program. Um, so, and putting their own money as well. Um, uh, question for Ruth. In Kenya, the strategy was um, non-communicable diseases based. Um, and so was focused on all cardiac access, not just um, medication. And so in Kerala, it, it has been focused on infant mortality and congenital heart disease, so different focus. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Would you um, start, Ruth, what do you think? Um, you know, you had a really broad coalition of partners. You talked about many different diseases. You, um, you know, what do you think was the advantage of that? And it, was there any disadvantage as well? Oh, thank you very much, uh, Bistra. I think uh, the advantage of that is uh, we had the numbers, so we were able to mobilize the government and they were able to listen because many people are talking about the same thing. The disadvantage would be, could be our voice was lost in there, you know, as much as we were trying to be at the forefront, like uh, we didn't have a clear focus on the heart diseases because it was taken as a group. And if, even if you look at the, at the things that are happening, they were done like for everybody, if it is in non-communicable diseases, because we are advocating as a package for non-communicable diseases. Yeah, the other challenge or, uh, could have been, uh, as uh, Kenya Mended having started in 2016, we are still in very early stages and we were not able to have like financing and be stable on our own. So that could have 
led to the and our, the advantage of having people to hold our hand and to help us and support us. Yeah. And I would say I was really impressed with that part of the story that you had early supporters in the Council of Churches and uh, Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance in Kenya. So this, I think this is a really um, interesting approach that, you know, probably some people don't consider is, you know, start with a bigger group while you still need to sensitize the government overall on non-communicable diseases. And then maybe as things progress, go the route that Children's Heartlink took and kind of start focusing on specific diseases. Um, Adriana, what would you say about this question? Yeah, I, you know, it, it's very interesting and, and the various approaches that there's no, uh, you know, right or wrong is just a different, different end of it. And I, likewise, I think we should, you know, we should advise and we have been advising the government to go and engage more of the, uh, of the families, the advocates, the family advocates, because that voice is so, so critical. And I think the disadvantage of having the government drive the agenda is that it really, um, uh, may miss on some very critical community-based needs. And so it has to incorporate, like it, there has to be a movement towards, a sh and, you know, and incorporating the community voice and community perspective and encourage uh, advocacy and empowerment from the families and those who are affected, uh, as well as thinking within the bigger kind of uh, universe of uh, NCDs. Um, the government representative that we work with uh, works on all child health uh, priorities. CHD obviously is a big one, but remembering that there's many other uh, that, that are connected to this, um, I think it's really critical as well. So uh, we started narrow, expanding and encouraging that expansion is, is very important. And we have advised the government that there is a need to mobilize really the community uh, around this to really hear attentively what are the needs from those who are experiencing them. Yes, yeah, very true. The next question is directed to Adriana, but I think both of you actually can answer is what are the strategies um, in terms of sustainability? So, so sustaining these successes that both of you talked about. Ruth, would you please start? You know, what, what do you think um, are the sustainability in the future of what you um, have achieved there? Thank you very much. Uh, I think in regards to Kenya, I'll say what we are looking for is uh, uh, in sustainability is involving the government and having them do most of the part, you know, as opposed to looking for a sponsor to sponsor one child for open heart surgery, we are going to the government and lobbying for them to like do more to them. So that way it's going to be for a long time, as long as the government is there. The other thing is, you know, once the policy change, it says that you uh, the only thing that can be done to it is improving it or making it better. Yeah. 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 So it was a national policy change that um, that's clear sustainable practice, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you, Abhistra. I think that is ensuring that there is ongoing secured funding is a critical element. Uh, the government has been very involved. Um, maintaining these high levels of involvement in the future, you know, as uh, as people uh, in leadership positions change uh, is critical, yet at the same time, very, very challenging. So actually uh, engaging more with the community, making sure that there is continuous pressure from the community uh, to continue this kind of work, I think is very important uh, to ensure a long-term sustainability so the government can't just change priorities because leadership changed. Um, and as well as um, uh, engaging and thinking about what is the lifelong care that the patients need. Uh, so really those transitions from the child to adulthood uh, and um, creating more awareness among the providers who provide the adult care uh, to be more aware of the needs of uh, children and patients with CHD as they grow older. So I think it's both uh, following the progression of a um, of the needs of a patient with CHD, as well as expanding uh, this uh, current engagement from government driven to actually being driven by community and government together. Yeah, yeah. And there is another question for you, Adriana. Um, how do you think the government of India succeeded to prioritize this policy while there are many um, other policies to handle, um, where did they get the motivation? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's part of the broader effort to improve um, uh, child survival. So the policy of RBSK was actually uh, had um, four Ds that it was addressing. So disability, uh, defects, uh, and um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the others, but it was um, addressing a uh, few elements uh, that um, uh, of you wanting to address few elements of the of what uh, would ensure child survival um, and improve the um, the quality of life. And we met the uh, one of the leaders who was very much involved in this. And I think it all comes. I mean, a lot of it is comes from the individual motivation of some of the leaders that you know they are they are in the right time, right place, and the work they have been doing for their lifelong. You know, is able to to come together um, and being able to be part of those discussions and um, has really enabled us, I think, to um, to seize the moment, you know, when when it happened to really waste no time and see what else can be done uh, and where what parts of the country were interested, where we were seeing interest, where was the motivation and really um, uh, provide those resources uh, to those who are more highly motivated uh, so that uh, the next step uh, steps could uh, come about. Ruth, I mean, same question for you. Where do you think the motivation came from the government to implement the policies that you were asking for? I know it's a different policy, but it's still a complete change. And I just want to say that um, I'm doing an assessment right now of different African countries of what's available. It is unique. Most places do not have what um, you are able to pass in Kenya. So it, I'm sure it's not sufficient. I'm sure there's still many people left out, but it is unique. A lot of places, most countries do not have it in on the African continent. So what do you think the motivation was for the government to pass it? Um, thank you very much. I think what happened is we put a lot of pressure on them because we could go even outside with posters, with placards, you know, saying, you know, we have a right to do this and this. And also a lot of media participation also led to that and holding a lot of meetings with them. Mm -hmm. I'll also point out like not everything has been passed already, but they have it, you know, they already have our information because we presented it to them, but like not everything they have, have been able to be worked on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's almost um, not even advocacy, but activism is. Yeah. Some of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in the case of Kerala, I think you had to walk a fine line. You don't want to, you know, you want to be supporting the government in what they what they want to achieve. Um, and um, I, there is a very technical question, um, Adriana, for for you. Um, from South Africa, we're in the process of implementing the pulse oximetry screening program to be implemented as part of a basic newborn care in South Africa. Um, they launched a training program and um, uh, the event was uh, supported by the provincial government. And so we're looking at a national planning and so asking if there is um, um, any guideline that they could be using um, nationally. Yes, thank you. So um, I think the fact that you have already uh, a more district specific or state specific uh, smaller um, uh, experience of implementing on a smaller scale is very critical. Uh, this is exactly Kerala, uh, likewise, having uh, launched their pulse oximetry on a statewide level was advising other states on what to do on a bigger scale. Um, I would say that um, the challenge, of course, for the national level is that uh, it would impact a lot of different districts with a lot of different capacities and needs, uh, specific needs. But I think um, by uh, holding uh, true to the goals of what needs to be achieved and uh, learning from the lessons of what you have achieved on the smaller scale implementation, um, it can be, um, that can be a very important uh, and helpful uh, type of experience. In India, post oximetry, there's no policy to be implementing it on a state, uh, on a country level. Uh, it's only state by state. And a lot of states have expressed interest, but it's still very much Kerala advising other states on how to implement it. Um, ultimately for Kerala, what uh, helped was identifying a device that the state could provide to the hospitals for free for public, at least public institutions and doing a lot of training and retraining and then uh, monitoring the data that uh, was coming in every day was submitted by every hospital in the public sector. But I think for them, the challenge is still about 
ensuring that such a program can be implemented on the private uh, side also, which it hasn't. And so scaling that is truly, truly the challenge. But I would suggest having some sort of way of capturing the data on daily basis so then that can be monitored. Where are the areas that are maybe not doing the screening or not doing it well, and then providing those trainings uh, as needed to continuously improve the quality. Thank you. So I think we're um, two minutes over, and I just want to thank you both for this was very, very interesting to me as well. Uh, it's always nice to do these um, interesting recaps of, of projects and um, you know, one, you can see it wasn't necessarily just advocacy, it was advocacy and activism on, you know, from Ruth's perspective. And the other one was technical assistance as advocacy uh, with the government. The, the, another, I think, important point that we need to make is to look at where the government is and to try to uh, provide them the right information on a regular basis so they can make the right decision. So I think both projects did that exactly. Um, and so in the case of India, you look at how they wanted to reduce a childhood mortality. Um, and in the case of, of Kenya, you had actually different uh, partners that helped you with getting to the right people and getting them the information you need. So um, thank you so much. And I can see other thanks are being sent through, um, through the chat box. This is being recorded. And so it will be saved on the Global Arch website. Um, and I hope that everyone enjoyed this. If you have more questions, please contact us and um, we'll try to answer them later. Um, thank you very much. I think you're thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Mr.